Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Now, this week's show is uh, time-sensitive, so... Let's just jump right into it. My guests this time around are the translators Tess Lewis and Alta Price, who are the co-curators of the 2021 edition of the Festival Noi Literature, or FNL, which we'll call it because my pronunciations are terrible. Uh, FNL is opening tomorrow, and for you time travelers out there, that means November 11th, 2021. Now, FNL... Um, well, it brings together authors from Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, and, and now Liechtenstein for the first time, uh, along with a pair of U.S.-based authors for a four-day series of panels, conversations, and readings about German language and, and American language fi or English language fiction. Um, FNL's been going on since 2009, and I've been doing podcasts with event curators and authors uh, for each year's show uh, to help support the festival since uh, 2016. It's a convoluted story as to how I ended up working with these guys, but it's one of the uh, unexpected boons and, and perks of the podcast. So anyway, this year's FNL is going to be a hybrid event with in-person sessions in Manhattan, coupled with virtual sessions with the Europe-based authors. And the theme, which is what we're here for, is Turn and Face the Strange. And... There may be no more appropriate theme than that nowadays. And that brings us to this week's guest. See, Tess and Alta recorded with me on <laughs> March 4th, 2020, uh, in advance of what was supposed to be last year's FNL, which was to be held in late April. But Alta was going to be in town from Chicago, so we recorded pretty far in advance, which I was just fine because, you know, better safe than sorry. And what could possibly change from March 4th, 2020 to April 21st, right? At the time, um, our primary concern around COVID and FNL was just that the authors from Europe wouldn't be allowed to travel to the nice, safe United States. And a week later, of course, everything went off the rails. And shortly after that, FNL was indefinitely postponed. And I decided to air those episodes anyway, with disclaimers about the FNL portions of the conversation, because there was so much other great stuff about Tess and Alta's lives and work and everything else. Um, but that was the, the second to last pod visit that I made before lockdowns began. And um, so when Tess wrote last week to say that FNL was back on uh, for 2021 and that Alta would be arriving in New York on November 9th, I offered to record in person with both of them, mainly to talk about bringing 2020's FNL and its theme to 2021, but also to to revisit or recapture that that moment just before our world tipped into another stranger one, and to mark a little of of how the past. 20 months have changed all three of us. And, and partly, I mean, it was like the the spatial associations of the whole thing. Like, this is one of the last houses I walked into before you couldn't go anywhere or do anything. And so I remembered, you know, the, the table we sat at and, you know, walking into the kitchen. I remembered where the bathroom is, just, just the, the sort of space of Tess's home and what it meant for someone to just bring you in um, and and not have that worry that we had, you know, even starting a, a week later. <sighs> so anyway, I am very happy that FNL is going on. Uh, it'll be this week. Like I said, I hope you're listening to this in close to real time. And I'm also really happy that the work Tess and Alta did for the 2020 event uh, will come to fruition at last. And I'm even more glad that they kept with the theme they selected and curated turn and face the strange because nothing speaks more to our time than than that 
Now, the kickoff event for FNL is in person. It's at the Goethe Institute in Manhattan on Thursday, November 11th. And that's where Tess is going to be keeping up uh, another FNL tradition, presenting the Friedrich Olfers Prize, which is awarded by the Deutsches Haus at NYU to a leading uh, publisher, writer, critic, translator, or scholar who has championed the advancement of German language literature in the U.S. I got that from the website. Um, this year's prize goes to Jill Schoolman, the publisher of Archipelago Books, who I'd love to record with sometime. And Tess will talk about her during the, the episode, too. Now, like I say during the show, I am hemming and hawing about attending that event tomorrow for obvious reasons. But I'll tell you, FNL sessions are always a blast. I've gone to a couple of them over the years in person especially since most of it is virtual this year, it gives you the opportunity to, to, you know, attend as much as you can. You don't have to go traveling into New York. They would do some of these in Brooklyn uh, when they were doing in person before, but most of it is virtual. There are, so just go to festivalnoiliteratura.org, uh, attend as many of the sessions as you can. If you're in the New York area, there will be a, a hybrid event on Saturday, November 13th, also at the Goethe Institute. Tess talks about that and, and why it would be great to have people in the room for it. I know I mangled the pronunciation of the name of the festival and the festival website. I will have links to it in the show and episode notes for this one. I'll also spell out the URL at the end of the episode. Uh, also, just wanted to point out, um, because they might be listening, FNL is a collaborative project involving a bunch of New York's German language cultural institutions, the Austrian Cultural Forum, German Consulate General, Permanent Mission of Liechtenstein to the United Nations, the Consulate General of Switzerland, Columbia University School of the Arts, the aforementioned Deutsches Haus at NYU, and Goethe Institute, New York. Um, I want to thank all of them for putting in the effort they did and having faith in putting together a 2021 event, knowing how, well, how chaotic everything is. Anyway, I have prattled on plenty. Uh, here are Tess and Alta's bios from the FNL site. I promise to butcher every pronunciation I can. Um, Tess Lewis's translations from French and German include works by Peter Hanke, Walter Benjamin, Anselm Kiefer, Maya Haderlap, Philippe Jacotet, and Christine Engelt. She has been awarded grants from Penn and the NEA, the Austrian Cultural Forum New York Translation Prize, the Penn Translation Prize, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. She is co-chair of the Penn Translation Committee and an advisory editor for the Hudson Review. She has written essays on European literature for a number of journals and newspapers, including the Hudson Review, World Literature Today, Partisan Review, The American Scholar, The Wall Street Journal, and Book Forum. She is delighted to be back with FNL, having curated the festival in 2014 and 2015. Alta L. Price runs a publishing consultancy specialized in literature and nonfiction texts on art, architecture, design, and culture. A recipient of the Gute Kunst Prize, she translates from Italian and German into English. Her latest publications include books by Martin Mosbach and Dana Grigorshea. And that's Romanian, so I should get that right, but I didn't. Her work has appeared on BBC Radio 4, Three Quarks Daily, Maraham Stories, Trafica Europe, Words Without Borders, and elsewhere. She is a member of PEN, the Authors Guild, and the American Literary Translators Association, the Third Coast Translators Collective, and Sedilia and & Co. And now... Let's turn and face the strange with Tess Lewis and Alta Price. So turn and face the strange. That's um, that's where we left off in March of 2020, and 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 now we're back. Um, FNL is happening this week. Have we turned and faced the strange? We have turned and faced so much more strangeness than I even expected. Um, yeah, so definitely we are doubling down. <laughs> I keep turning in different directions and seeing more strange. It's strange so I think in every there are way. multiple, as with a translation, there are multiple interpretations one can apply to this festival theme. <laughs> Tell me how it's it's come together after the about 20 month delay. It was supposed to be April of 2020 and now uh, November of 21. 
tell me about the 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 gap we'll talk about each of our pan well your pandemics hopefully not mine because i prattle all the goddamn time about that <laughs> Well, it's been kind of a cliffhanger uh, scheduling this, trying to schedule this um, festival because we thought, you know, as each wave ebbed, we would have a meeting and, you know, take a temperature check. Do we reschedule? Do we wait? Do we try in person? Do we make alternate arrangements? Do we cancel altogether? And we were so hopeful at the end of each wave that we kept saying, oh, no, let's do it, you know in the spring, in the fall, in the spring, in the fall, whenever. Um, and then in October, we had to make the final decision. The, mm -hmm. Some of the organizers are saying, look, you know, it's kind of time to fish or cut bait. So we said, all right, can't take chances. Travel ban is still on. Let's go online. And then two days later, <laughs> they announced they the travel ban was going away. <laughs> <laughs> so the travel ban was lifted yesterday and our event is starting this week. But you know what, we've got um, some great technical support who have helped us um, navigate the whole transition online. And I'm sure there will be a few bumps, but not more than, you know, we've gotten used to over these past 20 months. Have any of the authors thought of coming over with knowing that the travel ban was going to be lapsed in time? Or is it just too complicated to, to get them over here? There was so much back and forth over the summer because certain authors were saying, oh, we really want to come, but we're seeing these scary statistics from the U.S. And so it's just all of those curves fluctuating yeah. as they are. And so I think there was absolute willingness on the part of some authors, perhaps not all. But the, the reality is that the not knowing... Uh, and we did talk about jumping through major diplomatic hoops to try and get special permissions. Uh, but, it, you know, I thought for my day job, considered holding our annual conference in October in person this year. And by late August, the, even the hotel was just in the you know, if you give a 72 hours notice, you're not on the hook for any of the room costs or anything else. And I still thought I, I just can't do it. I don't know what October will look like. And I having everybody else go through their travel arrangements and then have to cancel. Can't do it. So we're doing virtual next month. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's a, well, I mean, it reminds me of where we were, you know, 20 months ago and we sat down at this, this table and we recorded separately. The concern was that the European uh, authors wouldn't be able to come to nice, safe America. That was, you know, as much as we were concerned, it was just, Oh, things are bad in, in Europe. They'll never let them come in here. And then we discovered, Things can get a lot worse here than we we really expected. It's um. Well, again, let's talk about the theme. Yeah, uh, tell well, me about turn and face the strange. Sure. In that yeah, case. yeah. I mean, that was that just added to the strangeness, this uncertainty of knowing, you know, what kind of, you know, the ground kept shifting between our beneath our feet. So hmm. it made it on the one hand a bit of a nail biter. On the other hand, you know, we had to keep thinking each time: how committed are we to the festival? Is the festival worth it? And we always came out saying yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, staging it virtually presents different challenges. You know, so in the past, it was always authors getting over jet lag and then um, traipsing all around New York. And one of them got laryngitis. Yeah, you're just saying getting one of them. I was driving into the city to record with an FNL uh, author a couple of years ago, and she emailed saying, I've got laryngitis. I can't talk. I have to save my voice for the final day. And I was just, thank you for writing me. I shouldn't have been checking my email while driving, but I'm glad mm. I, I did. But yeah, but yeah. yeah. Uh, but all the virtual side of things. Yeah, versus so the... scheduling. So uh, just every single step of the way, the turn and face the strange has manifested itself. Right. So we were all convinced or, you know, many of the backing organizations in April of uh, we, it, finally decided it would have to be, it was never canceled, it was postponed officially on April 1st of 2020, mm -hmm. um, which, yeah, just, that was a date as well. Um, but the, so with with this time difference and Europe falling back for mm -hmm. the time change, yeah. um, they did that two weeks before we did. So there was extra, you know, just people checking the time on their computers. And then, and then we're like, no, no, no. By the time the festival happens, it will be back to a six hour difference, not the seven hour difference. And just keeping everyone on their toes. Um, yeah. 
But what's, you know, you asked about the theme, and what's interesting is that, okay, Turn and Face the Strange, and we chose the six books, well, eight, counting the American authors. And we were concerned that um, these books would no longer be as relevant um, as, as they had been, and it wouldn't fit together in the same way. But it's it was funny to watch the books sort of change and become relevant in different ways, you know, address the strange, whether it's you know, the uncertainty of coming from a family or a region that's been devastated by war and then going back to it and finding something else, you know, that's really a parallel to a lot of what we felt, um, you know, coming out of the different phases of the pandemic and adapting. Or, you know, what what constitutes identity? How do we get our bearings mm -hmm. to figure out who we are is, um, is another theme that runs through a couple of these books. So, you know, Turn and Face the Strange is a pretty ideal theme, not just for the era we're living in, but for the particular books that we chose. Mm -hmm. And then we were, I, I feel as though we were lucky in that when, as we reevaluated periodically, um, you know, when we might be able to actually hold this festival, two of the authors have since, at least two, right? Anna Ba and um, Sasha Mariana Saltzman have new books out. So then the question became, oh, well, could we work their new books? Because it's a little bit strange to ask an author to talk about their older work. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it just worked out that, you know, we'd put a lot of work into preparing the, the sample translations and the, and the f theme fitting. So actually more than that, there, because Judith Keller has a novel out. Josh Cohen has a novel out. Oh, right, right. Yeah. So I think, you know, more than half of our authors had new books, <laughs> but they, they've all been very gracious and accommodating and saying, you know, we'll, we'll talk about, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about our work. But that's also one of the other things where reevaluating, is it still worth it? It's absolutely worth it. Um, and I mentioned the time change earlier because one of the events we pre-recorded mm -hmm. and it was one of the student interviews and it just gave me this breath of fresh air because, you know, we're all zoomed out. We're all just yeah. really another people really want me to just stare at a screen again. And it reminded me, this is why we care so much about storytelling, um, connecting these souls over multiple hours and thousands of kilometers or miles or whatever you want to call them and talking about the story and the artistic vision behind the stories. So I think it's going to be a very exciting week. As far as Zoom goes, and I know we're all Zoomed out. Uh, I, I was ecstatic today when a guy emailed saying, hey, can I give you a call? Uh, I want to ask about something. And it was literally my phone number. I was like, a phone call. This is great. I, I don't have to, have to do a Zoom. Have you developed good Zoom protocol? Have you figured out lighting and angles and, and all that stuff for yourselves? Or is it still just a, eh, you know, none of us are movie stars. It's, you know. <laughs> I think for me anyway, it tends on that end because it doesn't matter. How. I put a lot of time and energy into trying and figure out the sweet spot, the right camera lens, the angle of the computer, whatever. And the ring lights and everything. You, don't have. <laughs> you know, and then, of course, the time change, the sun hits differently. And anyway, um, I've I've decided to go with the spontaneous approach. Okay. And I embrace the spontaneity of, in literature, the content and the words and the style and the ideas <laughs> and the vision and the fantasy and the imagination always being more important than the visual realm that we necessarily have to Again, That's inhabit. why I stick with audio. I always tell people, if, if any of us were that good looking, you know, we'd be in Hollywood. You know, it, it's fine that we, we look like this. And of course, I'm saying that looking like... Although I do think a couple brothers. of these books might end up in Hollywood. So yeah, it's, heard, it's just my personal feeling. I've heard great stuff about the Josh Cohen one uh, mm -hmm. uh, of late too, but um, I could put you on the spot. Can you tell me about the authors? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I say this knowing that you both have notebooks yeah. out with with you know information about them, so you know less well, the the listeners think. Where panel? should we start? We could break it down by panel. Sure. Um, do you want to? Yours is on Saturday. Do you want to go first, or do you yeah. want to do it? Yeah. So I am moderating the Poisoned Roots panel mm -hmm. with Swiss author Eve Nashitz, German with American roots author Isabel Fargo Cole. Um, Croatian-born Austrian author Anna Ba and U.S. author Joshua Cohen. And we'll be exploring the ramifications of war and trauma, um, which sounds like a very hefty theme, but it really informs all of these books in 
radically different ways. So I'm really excited about hearing short readings from each of these authors and, and exploring that, those connections. Um, how much would you like me to say about each title? Yeah, tell me about the books. I'm also, as a side thing, I'm, I'm curious, do the authors interact or know each other much beforehand? I know they're not seeing each other in person this time. Mm-hmm. Is it different than, than past FNLs? I know it's a side question that takes us away from the, the content for a moment, but it just occurred to me. As, as... No, it's interesting because I do think some of them know each other. Yeah. Um, and certainly, for instance, I know that Isabel Fargo Cole and Sasha Mariana Saltzman have lived in the same city. <laughs> so know each other moving within yeah. within <laughs> literary circles, but certainly others uh, so have not. So it might be not. good that they're virtual so they don't come to blows or anything. Exactly, because that, that's exactly. Also a, Especially uh... those two. They're quite you know, conflict <laughs> prone. <laughs> but tell me about the, uh, the, the selections and what they're going to be working yeah, with. Yeah, so Isabel Fargo Cole's book is titled Das Gift der Biene which could either be translated as the bee's venom or the poison of the bees. And it's, I, I, sh, I want to recognize that Isabel Fargo Cole, who was born and raised in the U.S., but has lived in Berlin since, I believe, the late 90s. I might be wrong on my dates there. This is her second novel, which she has published in German. She also had her latest translation of Wolfgang Hilbich's uh, book titled The Interim, come out a few days ago from Two Lines Press. So she's an incredibly prolific, um, really highly regarded translator from German into English. And her second, but she's also a writer Mm -hmm. in, in German. Uh, So that's very exciting. And, and also fabulous. I I was worried when I heard that her new Hilbeek was coming out. I thought she's going to be very busy touring, doing events for the new translation. Will she still be available to talk about her novel? And she is. So that's great. Well, she's doing both. She's doing a lot of events. I encourage your listeners to look up to Google the different bookstores that she's appearing in. I saw her do a recent conversation online. And, you know, Hilbeek was a fascinating figure. And she is always interesting when she talks about translation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Ifna Schitz's book is titled Die Nachkommende, which is those who come after or those who come later. And it also deals with, uh, so it, it I, I hope, um, and this is why I would really encourage your listeners to attend the actual events, because I realize in encapsulating giving the nutshell version of these books because there are so many different countries and languages involved i hope it doesn't they don't all sound the same they're they're quite different um ifna uh lives in zurich she's also involved in theater um and this book deals with the the disintegration of the former yugoslavia um and and this this character's experience uh between switzerland and her former home and multi-generational, multilingual uh, relationships. And Anna Ba's book, Die Farbe des Granatapfels, The Color of the Pomegranate, um, deals with her, um, much of it takes place, and actually this, I had a recent conversation with one of the students who was intrigued by her book because, you know, you'll, you'll come across... Um, passages or phrases in Croatian and the student was was thinking am I supposed to understand this and, <laughs> yeah. and I said this is one of the brilliant things about literature and translation and it was it's exciting to see how translators handle these things um uh what what are you meant to understand and not understand and that the finessing that requires between um, okay, so German readers can understand a certain thing and very intentionally not understand something else and bringing that into English. And then, of course, Joshua Cohen's Moving Kings mm-hmm. uh, that deals with uh, moving company and, and uh, Israeli relatives coming to help out in the family company and processing their, their trauma from having served in the Israeli army. But in the greater New York region. So, again, another very specific location and specific memories and traumatic um, histories to process with immense, an immense sense of humor. So, 
because we're Jews. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm just stereotyping, <laughs> but that's us. You know, that, that that's our, our whole shebang. And Tess? So my uh, panel uh, is called Alternate Realities, mm -hmm. and it explores how fiction can help us question our assumptions about what seems most familiar. And we will, through these books, we'll talk about the way literature can sharpen our sense of reality or realities by unsettling us. Um, I'm kind of taking guidance from Wittgenstein's, uh, I guess it's a, his, his saying, that um, the limits of our language are the limits of our world. And if that is the case, how can we expand those limits? So the that's a lot of ground to cover. And the authors that um, will be taking part are Sasha Mariana Saltzman, who is one of the author, German authors, the only German author whose book has been translated. Her novel is called Beside Myself, and it is it traces one twin's search for the other um, from spanning Russia, Germany, Istanbul. And so what's interesting to see is how the narrator's sense of themselves changes with the ground that they are covering. There's gender, <laughs> gender fluidity, which is why I'm consciously using they for the narrator, um, not specifying. And there are cultural markers and cultural pressures that change the tone and the, the, of the book and the story. Another, um, the second book is the Austrian Liechtensteinian writer Benjamin Quaderer, whose book um, called Für immer die Alpen, um, Always the Alps, is about a con man in Liechtenstein. And what does it mean to be a con man in a country that is just a fraction of the size of New York City, you know, where people know each other and you... you. Uh... Oh, that's when my dad left Israel and came to America. I don't know if I ever got into this, but in the 60s, he realized that there were only so many people he could pull a con on back there because they all knew each other. So, yeah, came to America and found a whole new world to, to be a confidence man in. But I'm there saying you go. too much. So. Yeah. Well, that is, that is um, I think then you will enjoy this novel once it's translated into English because it is about finding a, a wider field of... Sheep. To harvest. Marks. Yes. Okay. Um, and the third German language author is Judith Keller. She is Swiss. Um, her book is called The Questionable Ones. And it is a fabulous selection of short texts. Some are a single sentence. Some, the longest is, I think, three or four pages. And it is... Um, a, a study in how language can be used to understand the world and de destabilize the world. So her characters are always a little bit at a loss, partly because they take language literally. So if you use an idiomatic expression like, you know, um, being under your potential, she has the potential above this character and the character's looking up and saying, come down, potential, be with me. Um, you know, things like that, where she unpacks expressions or concepts um, and reapplies them. And all of a sudden, language looks different. The world around you through which you understood it, either through that particular phrase or just your vocabulary, suddenly you find your tools are either inadequate or, or perhaps better tuned to, to help you navigate the world. And our American author who will be joining that is Helen Phillips. Her book is The Need, and it is a, a very spooky, unsettling, um, I can't, don't think you can call it science fiction, but maybe speculative fiction, mm -hmm. where a woman who has two young children, uh, four years old and an infant, is sleep deprived and suddenly finds that, you know, strange things are happening around her. And she starts to have visions. There's a person who comes into her life that may actually be her double or it may be someone else. And you don't actually know for a long time or at all. Um, and so that sense of feeling and being very much at home and all of a sudden having it flip 360 and no longer knowing who you are, you know, who your children are, 
you know, um, looking at yourself from the outside is an interesting way to re-enter the world after a pandemic. Speaking of increased relevance, you know, we have to, we are approaching these lives that were kind of routine um, for many of us. Take all those things we take took for granted, you know, we re-examine them in a different, more pointed way. So it's going to be, a, I think, a, a great panel. That's on Sunday at one o'clock. And the books really, uh, did you find yourself revisiting the authors? Uh, you mentioned how they, they grew more relevant as the pandemic progressed. With that big gap that we had, you know, were you checking in basically, sort of just re-examining the text, or did they just kind of you know, now that we have a date, let's, let's, you know, come back to the books and, and holy crap, it turns out they're even better than we, we thought they were going to be for the time. I guess I'm asking, did you, did you sort of stay in touch with the, the, the text themselves over this, this span, or was it sort of a, we had to wait, we didn't know. Speaking you know. solely for myself and yeah. having, having read them previously, they were, in, they were back there in my mind. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's one of the other beauties of, of, of these particular stories is that they were, they were sort of there, but coming to the fore in different ways. And then I've certainly revisited them now, you know, yeah. since it's actually happening, it's been great. And, and as with any rereading, you find certain of your previous experiences with that book confirmed and others have changed because you have changed since last reading them which is the entire point of my 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 show if not my entire existence is is figuring out yep. how the books keep getting better yeah. or changing on me you know yeah but, you know. uh i do want to just make a nod uh, to name the translator of sasha mariana saltzman's book beside mm -hmm. myself imogen taylor that came out from other press in 2020 i think i yeah we got galleys um, yeah. before it had come out so that is available to readers if they want to check it out and um, and Tess, you're translating Judith Keller. Yes, I I loved these um, these this, these I guess flash fiction or microfiction uh, pieces so much that I was able to find a publisher for it. So that will come out next year with Seagull Books. Congrats! Yes, something to look forward to. Is that f format, style, genre, however you describe it, easier or tougher than some of the translating you've done, or is it more just the the language itself? Oh, um, some it's, it varies. Some of the, some of her sort of puns and wordplay and unpacking of idiomatic expressions transfer very easily. Maybe not exactly, but using a similar, um, idiomatic expression, I can recreate it. But there's, a, there are a few, I have to speak with her about this. Uh, there are a few <laughs> that I think are not trans, they are untranslatable. In the, I mean, I could translate it and explain, but it's untrans. It's not. I'm not. They cannot be translated with the uh, concision and punch that yeah. she delivers. For example, there is one called Vreneli, which is a woman's name, um, a diminutive woman's name in Switzerland. But it's it's like. Uh, but she is on the the uh, a coin, a, a high value coin in uh, Switzerland, one of the denominations. And it's like calling Ben Franklin, you know, for the, for the, the $100 bill. The Benjamins, yeah. So mm -hmm. she plays on someone who is praying to Renali, and you don't really know if the Renali is the coin, is money, yeah. um, or if you're playing praying to a person. So this is something that I'm either going to have to work out a solution with her. I know that she has a whole bunch of other... Um, of these flash fictions, I may just substitute one that transfers more easily without the, the burdensome. I'm not going to do footnotes. I'm not. Yeah, gonna, I was going to say if you have to explain, yeah, <laughs> then it's not funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I would say that translating that book has spanned from piece of cake, you know, delightfully easy, you know, smooth transitions to just impossible. But as a reader. To me, the parts that I have seen, it's clear to me, even the challenging ones, that you were enjoying it. Yeah, I mean, that's because that, and that's something I think the reader can feel. Mm -hmm. So tell me about work. Tell me about non FNL, what you've been, well, not even work. How have your pandemics been? <laughs> I guess that's, that's the big question because you are literally that, that almost last moment of the before time 
when we didn't really know what this was all going to be. How have you been? Well, what has this you know, been like? translators, not all of them, but, but most of them are pretty solitary creatures for much of the day or the week. So in some senses, existence didn't change at all, aside from being, you know, a bit more isolated and lonelier. On the other hand, you know, you were asking about whether or not we revisited the books. I had read them carefully. I even did an event with Sasha Mariana Saltzman about her book. I could not remember the... F I couldn't remember anything. <laughs> yeah. All those books and other books that I read during the pandemic or just before were like wiped clean. Yeah. As I read them again, you know, things came back and I remembered. But if I had had to get up and do an event without rereading them... I. <laughs> and be like, so tell me about your book. Yeah. <laughs> no, and then, oh, yeah, I remember yeah. that part. No, for me, it was that first month I couldn't finish anything. Uh, March into April, I just, I was stuck in this Kurt Anderson book. I had a couple other things, couldn't get anywhere. Finally read this hyper propulsive science fiction novel by Matt Ruff. It took me like a day and a half and it just retracted my brain. Then mm -hmm. I could go back and, and read. But yeah, we were in a state of confusion, I guess, as far as that goes. How about you? Oh. Yeah. So uh, I am I feel as though I'm translating more than I was before, which is a weird thing to say. Um, I moved house at the start of the pandemic, so that was exciting and terrifying. Um, and I think I have had several. I did have a chance, which rarely happened before, to do some pleasure reading outside of the reading I do, uh, the reading that I do as I'm translating for yeah. work. Um, which isn't, I mean, of course, I, I feel immense pleasure. Non-work reading. We'll, we'll just say that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a slightly different, different gear when you can read a book without knowing that you're going to have to dissect every oh, Same single... thing with the show. The, the books yeah. that I read, not for guests. I got over the guilt of, oh, I should be reading guest book X. And, you know, I, I finally reconciled, mm -hmm. but... Yeah, you, you look over my reading list and you could see who was intended for a guest and who was just Gil having fun. So, yeah. so who did you read for fun? Who did I read for fun? Oh, I'm going to come back to that question. Okay, that, that'll be... You know. Because as much as I did very deep reading, there's something about the, the memory disk in my brain is much like when the computer says the, the RAM is filling yeah. up. Um, or when like, my, my, my backup recorders little... came back with disk is full last week yeah. when I tried to save the, the, the episode. But as far as, as, as far as translation goes, you found you're, you're doing more nowadays. I feel as though I am, but uh, I just finished a massive, massive book that's coming out next year that I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I really, I'm so focused on the festival. I know you're yeah, pointedly not asking moment, us but, about but the yeah. festival, but I have, um, yeah, a, a major German novel about identity politics. And once again, very, very funny. Um, a lot of it unfolds in tweets and the author had a lot of fun making up Twitter handles. Okay. So lots of humor to handle. I think it's slightly different than Tess when you were translating Judith Keller. Was every section of that book uh, named after a, a tram stop in Zurich or just a lot of them? There's a the, certain section. There's it, there's seven sections named after seven tram stops. Yeah. So those are just the headings. And sometimes the tram stops are referenced or that part of the city is referenced, but m some of them are, could be anywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's this interesting play also in, in, in this novel, um, which maybe I'll talk to you once it's more concrete. Oh, definitely. I'll we'll yeah. sit down yeah. with the idea that maybe I'll come out to Chicago, which then raises the question, besides you coming out here for, for this, have you guys been able to travel? Have you done anything? Because it's really weird for me. Like mm. I, I, I lived not up in the air level, but, you know, 30, 40,000 miles a year of, of travel. And it's been zero for, for quite a while now. I, I do miss going to Europe, and I miss my friends there, um, but I'm not really eager to get on a plane and go anywhere far. I, I, I did visit family. Um, I will be going to Berlin in January for four months, so I figure that will make up for my uh, <laughs> my being stuck at home for, for 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I've done a little bit of domestic travel, 
bought a whole bunch of new masks for this trip. Also wasn't sure, part of turning and facing the strange for this was, I think you all uh, back here, at least in the New York area, the mask mandates have been lifted because the numbers are low, or that's my understanding, to a certain degree, which yeah. has not taken place in, in Chicago, Illinois. So. I'm not sure with New York. Um, when we had the, the trade show at the Javits a few weeks ago, it was vaccine cards plus full mask mandate indoors. Um, but I was in the city last week meeting uh, an Italian client company of mine, and they wanted us wearing masks when we got to the restaurant that we, we noshed in, but, you know, basically just took off and walked around. And nobody beat anybody up on the subway for not a, not wearing a mask. I got on the subway for the first time in, in again, 20 months. It was a... Uh, Strange. Again, yeah. Again, strange <laughs> is going to be this this ongoing theme throughout this. And, and so I'm awfully glad, you know, FNL is actually happening with, mm -hmm. with you know, keeping the, the theme. You didn't get paid for two festivals, right? I'm just kidding. I I'm wish. <laughs> <laughs> are they offering you a makeup festival down the line to, to curate again? Or are they going to impose that on you, know, you as that a penalty? You know, that jury's yeah. out just because everything is so much up in the air. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the sponsoring institutions, the Austrian Cultural Forum, the German Consulate, the Swiss consulate, Pro Helvetia, Deutsches House, the Goethe Institute, mm -hmm. Liechtenstein, I want to make sure I get them all, um, have been have been very supportive and seem to be committed to the um, the festival and 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 hope to continue it in the future. But you know, yeah. I guess it depends on where the pandemic goes right. fundamentally. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to be in Milan this week. Mm -hmm. There's a trade show going on there and I I just don't think people are going to go. I don't feel comfortable about airports and mass transit in Italy. I'll, I'll put it that way. Sure. And, you know, I figure in my pharmaceutical world, a lot of the people who'd be attending and exhibiting are from India and China. And apparently they're not coming in because if they go home, they've got to sit for two weeks before mm -hmm. they can go out. So I've got friends reporting back from Milan, but I was just, I even asked my board a couple of weeks ago, should I bother? They're like, yeah, I'll just stay home. It, mm -hmm. It's okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But this is another interesting element. I think the pandemic, I haven't, I haven't even really thought about it so much, but I just realized a, a parallel with translation is that yesterday I had a conversation with someone in Chicago who was speaking about the pandemic in past tense. This person asked me how my pandemic was. Um, and I was not experiencing the pandemic in past tense because I was living with the anxiety of going to an airport and, yeah dealing with mass transit and visiting um dear friends you know having having friends and colleagues who are immunocompromised i mean none of this is i'm very aware of these differences but i realized frequently one of the one of the fun challenges of translation is that different languages deal with tense mm -hmm. and and markers of time in different ways and i thought wow, my life is just now resembling more. Translation is taking over. It had already taken over my brain, but it's taking over my actual life where people are doing things. Some are speaking about it in the past tense, but it's still future or present for others. And, and that's just how it is. And that is another element of the strangeness. Mm. Yeah. It's, um, we've learned a lot. Or we're discovering we don't know a lot, right. and and I don't mean in a scientific or factual way. I mean we're we're discovering an awful lot about people and the way things work that mm. I don't think any of us. I think some of us may have suspected before yeah. all this began, mm -hmm. but but didn't realize you know things would turn out quite the way they did. <sighs> and a larger question about the pandemic, and I promise we'll go back to FNL uh, in a minute. But is there a way that um, the way the pandemic has demonstrated the interconnectedness of everything on this planet um, affected the way either you see translation or that you see the need for people to, to get exposed to, to writing from other, other cultures, other languages. Is it something that, that in a way seems any more pronounced now, I suppose, than it did 20 months ago? I Not always, to toot your own horn and say that everybody should be reading everything in translation. No, but, I, I always you know. feel like a broken record. I also feel like when I'm speaking to fellow translators or editors or even readers, you know, I think your listenership, they, they read a lot. Clearly, yeah. they're interested in engaging with the world. 
So I always feel like a broken record saying, oh, this is important. It's a, it's a way of connecting. But I will also say that I have, I have noticed, I think Zoom, I've noticed in my own personal emotional reactions, I get it, this intense um, seeing people. I've seen colleagues in, in other countries that I used to see when I would go on a residency somewhere, but I did not see them. I've seen them more frequently during the pandemic. Hmm. And it's very exciting, but it's also not the same as it's, it's deliberate. spending time together. Everything yes. has to be deliberate in this world. There's no accidents yeah. when, when you don't just walk on the sidewalk and bump into someone. Or have yeah. a conversation in the hallway, as I as I call it. But, yeah, and I've yeah. had significantly events that altered the course of my life happen by serendipity, and that yeah. so it feels as though I've entered this different realm in that way. Now, I do think literature plays an important role here. Um, I also think, again, speaking solely for myself. <laughs> The the pandemic and the isolation, uh, you remember back when they said two weeks to stop the spread? Um, the the uh, Tess mentioned earlier that, you know, my my day to day life did not change too much. I had for more than 15 years worked full time from a home office. Um, but there was something about the rest of the world having to shift more onto that level that that was very bizarre for me but i also think it's the so the intense emotion of the the connectedness but it's a different connectedness it's not this, it, it, you say commonality maybe instead of connectedness or a common well go on well go on. no just the, that that feeling that you're you're seeing people you're talking to people but it's um it's not the connection that we're accustomed to yeah. and i do think that the technology mitigated connectedness is um, doing strange things to our human brains. I'll tell you, uh, the, the trade show in New York, I had no idea you were this tall. Because all with sure. people who just saw me on Zoom, yeah. we'd have a conversation. All They see, they see the library behind me because I, I set up my camera so that everybody can see books at all times. But yeah, there's, there's, there's no scale. And when you're used to seeing people as little tiles, yeah. it's weird. But yeah. I, I agree absolutely with them. With Ulta, that the the, the the technological mediation makes this connected it's feel more superficial. It's better than nothing, but it's not. I don't know. I will get off to um, conversations with people that I'm glad to see feeling depleted rather than energized, which didn't happen when I saw them in person. Um, but on a sort of a bigger macro level, I feel that there's with so much more urgency that it's important to read translated fiction because what scared me, one of the things that scared me among many about the pandemic was the immediate fallback to nationalism and borders and borders slamming shut in ways that were completely unreasonable. Uh, what, you know, where, yes, okay, so the borders shut, but there are ways for the wealthy and the connected to get through. Or, you know, this group of people can't come through and enter the country, but, oh, if you're related to someone or if you come through another country, you can come in. Um, it was a knee-jerk nationalism and a suspicion of the other that, you know, I hadn't seen in a long time. It was rearing its head now and again um, during the last four years, but just the me to see immediacy with which people regressed to that, you know, the ease of saying, oh, our, my country, this border, that um, was frightening. And so literature becomes the fallback to cross those boundaries, to understand the world from someone else's perspective. Or not understand it. Or not understand it. <laughs> yeah. But at least yeah. have contact with it. Yep. Yeah. And wonder, wow, how does that work? Yeah. Along those lines, discovering new authors or new new books have you been able to do that during this, or has it been tougher? You know, I haven't really had time to read, so I have discovered all sorts of new authors, and I have bought the books, and they are sitting on my table. Yeah, I mean, for and pleasure I reading, like, like if yeah. it's somebody in translate or somebody you're looking to translate, is it? Oh, I that haven't process... been able to do that because so much of that for me was was going and, and yeah, speaking, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah, yeah. With, with people that I, I like or showing up at readings. I discovered Judith Keller because 
a friend, I was in residency in Switzerland, and a friend said, oh, I'm going to this reading. Do you want to come with me? And I said, sure, not expecting much of anything. But I was so taken, not just with the text, but the way that Judith Keller performed them. She put all these little microfictions in a hat and had a <laughs> bass player. And so the bass player would imp improvise, and then she would pick out one of her stories, read it, and then the bass player would improvise on that. It was great. Mm -hmm. um, and so that sort of things just not happened. And, you know, I have signed up for a few equivalents things on Zoom, but my eyes glaze over yeah. and I just don't remember anything. And, yeah. But I have a, such a backlog of work, it would be irresponsible to be out hunting new, <laughs> new, new yeah, prey. Those are irresponsible. And then there's that personal drive that nonetheless yeah. you know, pushes you there. Alda? I'll jump in. I mean, I haven't finished reading it yet, which is, I thought I was pretty convinced I would sit in, uh, read it in one sitting, um, Teju Cole's Black Paper. Mm -hmm. And I mention it because he had a really fabulous article, I mean, so that to share, to share with folks that um, translation goes multiple ways. He had a great piece a couple of months ago in the New York Review of Books. I think it might have been an online-only piece. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he talked about his experience being translated into other languages from English and how his Italian translator had to come up with a word um, to describe what he was talking about. And just it was it was beautiful and moving because there was this acknowledgement that not only was he able to be read in these other languages by people far away, um, you know, his ideas frequently talking about photography and art, but so, so much more than that. And um, so, and so his book came out very recently, and I've just started it, and it's on pause for the festival so that I course, can be fully immersed. But I can't wait to get back to it. I've ordered it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and in terms of finding potential authors to translate, has that been? Uh, did you run into the same issue that Tess has? I've had a few. Well, I'm I'm translating an author who has been translated into English a lot. He's incredibly prolific. Um, if I can stray from the German theme of tonight, um, Giorgio Agamben is a an Italian philosopher. So um, that was not a discovery for me. But uh, I'm translating for Siegel Books his uh, a book of his about nominally about the poetry of Friedrich Hölderlin. But it's really about the last half of Hilderland's life. Um, again, a lot has been written about German capital R romantic poetry. But, and this is very much, I want to say, a pandemic book. Um, it, he didn't write it during the pandemic. I think it came out, let's see, it came out in Italian February of 2021, I think. He's, re he's been writing a lot of articles that have been translated by other people into English about just how how the lockdowns were handled in Italy and but this is it's it's beautiful because he goes through it sort of a day-to-day -day inventory of what Hilderland's life uh, and for those who are not familiar with Hilderland's work he he was this major poet and then he suffered what um, many people would would say oh he he had schizophrenia or this psychic um, psychological break and lived the the latter half of, and it was exactly I talk about turning and facing the strange, the latter half of his life. So the first 36 years, um, and then shifted for the next 36, and he lived in this tower above the Necker River and kept writing poetry. A lot of critics say, and I have me, uh, Michael Hamburger's complete um, translations into English, um, but a lot, you know, was it still Hölderlin writing? He he signed a lot of them with pseudonyms. So this exploration again of identity, and um, but at the same time in Agamben's book he he explores what it means to actually inhabit a space and a being and a person and what is life uh, if you're living in one room or if you're not interacting with people and but you have people who go out and buy things for you and here's what they spent darning your socks and here's what they spent on groceries and all of this I thought this is ancient history but it took on this new significance yeah. certainly over the past year and a half. He had his own version of DoorDash so that's, yeah. that's something. Yeah, he did. <laughs> oh, tell me about the Old First Prize. Uh, I know, I'm know. i sure we talked about it 20 months ago yeah. but no one's going to go back and listen to that one. What's the uh, who, well, who's the, the recipient? So the, the Old First Prize which is um, Donated always at the opening night of the, of the or conferred the opening night of the festival, was founded by Friedrich Olfers, a professor emeritus of 
German literature at NYU, and it is given to an editor, writer, translator, um, publisher, who has done, uh, you know, great work in spreading German literature, knowledge of it, and the experience of it, and love of it, in um, basically in the United States, but also in the in the English speaking world. So editors like Carol Brown Janeway um, of Knopf, Sarah Burstel of Metropolitan have won it, uh, Barbara Epler of New Directions, the translator and professor Burton Pike, Susan Bernofsky, who was uh, curator of the festival for years, as well as being a talented translator and uh, professor and teacher of translation. Um, they've all gotten this prize, and this year is going to Jill Schoolman of Archipelago Books, a press she founded 20 years ago, devoted 99% um, to works in translation. Definitely all world literature, but she has a few uh, South African writers who write in English. And she um, is eminently deserving. She Archipelago Books is just, you know, um, intrepid in discovering uh, new writers bringing new voices to English language readers, and her dedication to her writers is phenomenal. She keeps them in print, and she doesn't care if they only sell a hundred copies in the first year. She's going to keep them a print in print and available. So that's exciting. Um, for listeners who are listening before the festival, there will be an, a, a translation event on Sunday, at uh, Saturday. 13th at 4 o'clock, and it will be focused on translation. There'll be three sections. The third section will be uh, Jill Schoolman speaking with me and two of her translators about, you know, about the press and what it, her dream was and, you know, to the extent to which she's accomplished that and her plans for the future. So it'll be, um, I think, worth tuning into that if you're interested in publishing and in uh, publishing translate, in translation. And I'm I'm still hemming and hawing about coming in Thursday night for the the I did an RSVP so they could throw me out anyway but but yeah I just have the going into New York yeah thing I'm I'm, I'm still just you know hesitant about adding any more risk than than you know I already it's have a, you know it's a tough call yeah I I was there was a great article I just well not a great a funny article I read this morning uh, one of the Atlantic magazine people who's part of the COVID tracking project. Um, came up positive and you know after 18 months of of guarding against every risk somehow i went to a friend's wedding in new orleans and of all th i was like no that that's pretty much like the the bad idea genes from from saturday night live mm -hmm. once upon a time that's that's really you know that there was your mistake right it doesn't matter what other precautions you took mm. you, you traveled to new orleans new york i do feel more more comfortable with and you know feel like i could probably park nearby and and come in and and see you guys and, and, you know, see you give out the prize and get to, to, you know, get the FNL experience again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it'll be smaller, but it will, it's still, it'll be wonderful to have, um, to have everyone there celebrating Jill and Archipelago books. Jill's a rock star. She is. <laughs> she just, you know, she, she started this in her, uh, 18 years ago, 19 years ago in 2003 in her studio on West 12th. And has been publishing ten to twelve books a year for uh, since then for eighteen years. So she has two hundred and twenty something books in print, something like forty languages. She's she's amazing, and uh, you know all different periods, all different genres, all different styles. She's fabulous. Since we all consider the pandemic to be ongoing, do you guys have post pandemic? dream vision it's i know you're going to go to, to berlin for for four months and we'll consider that the you know you, you've gotten past it you can now make that jump and, and yeah. go there that long that, that's my dream i may have to go there with the mask and you know take precautions or greater precautions even than i do now but i'm still excited about going yeah i'll do i suppose i dream of residencies and travel again but for now i'm pretty content immersed in my books yeah. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in particular you'd want to go, though? <sighs> At this very moment? No. 
I was on an airplane this morning. Oh, yeah, God. <laughs> you just want to be conked out, still not dealing with other human beings, much less, you know, some long haired schlub from New Jersey, I, I guess. But, but... Hair is great. You and I have avoided seeing. Uh, I was about to say frisure. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've no hairdressers. I since just the beginning of the pandemic. Once yeah. I reach a certain point, you know, when it got past afro into you know falling down on my shoulders, mm -hmm. that was the well. I may I may as well just keep this going until somebody really points out how ludicrous I look. But as midlife Actually, crises you know, go, with, with about four more inches, you could be, you could do Albrecht Durer. I I got that this morning from someone because I posted a picture. Uh, I was wearing a cardigan, so it has a big shawl collar, so the the hair kind of you know falls down from that. So I realized. I, there's no way to go out on Halloween as Dora, but you know no, somehow, not really, no. yeah, unless I, I derez <laughs> my face a little and make the lines much finer. But yeah, it's it's you know, I guess that sense of discovering things about oneself, which I guess is a pandemic question. Have you found any anything about yourself through this, good or bad, or had the you know living my best pandemic life moments? I mean, I ran 20 miles on New Year's Eve and couldn't run again for for quite a while after that, but discovered that I could actually run 20 miles in a, a shot. Anything in terms of, wow, I didn't realize this is who I was. <sighs> I still have no clue who I am. I thought maybe that's why I love translation. <laughs> I can just be my <laughs> authors for a little bit or their characters. Usually uh, I did run a marathon without actually it being technically a marathon. So that was, that was fun. Um, virtual or you just happen to wind up doing 26 um, did 26.2 not virtual I mean yeah, it wasn't tied no. to an event you just right right on my own so that was yeah I suppose endurance so we'll say the pandemic's driven you insane okay we'll, we'll go with that <laughs> I, I think it's up to my level I, I was aware before that I had certain limitations and uh, maybe I've just stopped caring about them maybe I've embraced them Anything in life that you've, wow, I did not realize. I am an introvert. And yeah. I didn't realize just how lonely introverts can get. My life pre-pandemic was always kind of protecting the time that I need to recharge after. I, I enjoy seeing people and talking to people and so forth, but it but some people time. get energized, others get depleted. I get depleted so um, then I found, wow, you know, take that away. And it's, it really is, um, unsettling it. So it, it required, um, really uh, me to reexamine what, how I wanted to connect with people, both in person when it's possible and, uh, virtually. So I, and this, the regret for, all those things, the people I didn't see, thinking, oh, you know, I can have coffee next week, or I'll see them next mm -hmm. month. And mm -hmm. and that, you know, some some friends didn't make it, and I won't see them. So my resolution, despite my <laughs> introversion, is to make sure that I don't uh, fall back on excuses of the, oh, you know, I'll just do it next time. Yeah, we'll do it on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it really, you know, the pandemic, this whole fallout really does make you re-examine uh, mechanisms that you've relied on to get through the day, let's say. And maybe they were hurting more than they were helping. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, I mean, we're seeing it on a macro scale too, certainly, but... Yeah, that, that sense of personal transformation, good or bad, or at least assessment's been, well, the more time we've had to ourselves, you know, I've got no kids. So it's just me and my wife and my dog who it talks back sometimes, but, you know, only when I'm having an episode. I'm kidding. But, <laughs> but yeah, that sense of, of sort of reevaluating or at least trying to evaluate, you know, what you had and how you were functioning, which again, I would say gets us away from FNL, but it turns us back to you know, what it is to, to you know, have changed our perspective right, like this. To turn and face the strange and find out that you are a stranger to yourself in a lot of ways. And anyone you're looking forward to see? I don't know. Are people coming in for FNL as far as you know? Is there anyone you're, you're looking forward to? I, I don't really know okay. who's going to come. And I'm, I'm the one in-person event that's open to the public is the translation event. And I really hope. I am so, 
hopeful that the translation community uh, will be able to of New York will be able to come. I don't expect anyone to travel in for it, but um, it just makes such a difference when an event is in person, and you know when you have the opportunity for serendipitous um, conversations and meetings. That's why I use that Frank O'Hara line: "The only truth comes face to face." So for each of you, uh, when we did the episodes last year, I, I took a pull quote out of um, you know each of them and, and ran that at the top of the episode. Uh, Alta's was, uh, books were my first drug. Mm -hmm. uh, but for you, and I don't know the context because I, I'm afraid to go back and listen to my old episodes from before this because I'll cry. Um, don't be afraid of crying, Gil. Oh, that, that's a huge part of my life. I've, I've, I've managed to just keep that entire self completely suppressed. But again, maybe in translation, it'll come out. Oblivion works its way through the world. And I, I don't know the context in which you, you put it, but I saw that line at the top of the episode and thought, that was before we knew what Oblivion was going to be like. I mean, that makes me think of your translation of Maya Hotterlop's Angel of Oblivion. Yeah. Which we were talking about. So that was probably the context of it. Um, yeah. And there were a few pandemic uh, books by the Brazilian writer that Danny Hahn translated um, I think it was just called, well, Hector Abad has a memoir called Oblivion. And then there was, there was um, another one by a Brazilian novelist. So Oblivion also became a theme um, imposed from outside and coming from within in um, some of the books that people were, some of the pandemic reading lists. Mm -hmm. um, Oblivion does work its way through the world. I bet it was in, con in, con in, con in conjunction with the novel Angel of Oblivion, because hmm. it's about mastering history and what it takes to remember the past. Who writes the past? And once it's written, you know, which version are you going to remember? So last question, and you get alternates on this one. Either what would be your theme for another FNL or what would you want your pull quote to be? Which is close to saying, do you have a slogan that you'd, you'd want to... I have, I, I have, I already have a wish list for a future FNL, yeah. and it has to do with the way, um, I don't want to use Faulkner's quote that, you know, history isn't dead, it's not even past, but the way the, you know, history, um, ghosts of history, both tangible and intangible, color the present in but in Switzerland, Austria, and um, and Germany, mm -hmm. you know whether it's um, the the um, Ghana Ghanaian or the British German writer of Ghanaian descent Sharon Dodua Oto, for example, her novel called Ada's Room follows a several characters named Ada through centuries, continents and situations um and you know so it's not specifically you know resurgence of the holocaust but it is you know how the after effects of colonialism and how even they, they will affect someone from a country that didn't have anything specific to do with the colonialism that of the place that they come to so that sort of would be that's the vague idea that i would yeah have for a future FNL. That's why I need a co-curator. Like exactly. Mm -hmm. No, so this is, I'm, I'm now thinking, I've been doing a lot of reading up on, and, and I was speaking to my spouse about this just last week, how with um, Tanat, I feel like this is a whole other episode about sort of colonial history and post-colonialism and decolonialization. I, I had to say, and I didn't mention it to the Camus author I was talking to last week, but I came across something on Twitter. I forget. It was one of the international relations guys I read. He said something to the effect of historians will look back on the 20th century and the Cold War will be a footnote next to decolonization. And mm -hmm. I just had that moment of, yeah, yeah, it's probably right that, you know, mm -hmm. That that change in in mankind is going to be a lot more important than you know who built up how many nukes over fifty years and how did we fight through that? But anyway, 
Right, but yeah. they're also connected. Oh, definitely. Right. Yeah, so, there are client states um, and, and how we, we support Yeah, the, the, the yeah. spheres of influence and thinking about Ada's, Ada's realm, which is Ada's room, but also Ada's realm, I think. John Chopolizzi is translating it, mm-hmm. right? And, um, and thinking about just, was it earlier this week or last week, the first uh, black German woman was elected to the Bundestag. Um, so, and this, the, the book by Mitu Zanyal called Identity or Identity, however you want to, tr- to pronounce it, um, really looks at concepts of identity, but also, um, so what I was, sorry, my fragmented oh, speech, please, please. <laughs> I was speaking to my spouse last week about how when we so much post-colonial, when people talk about colonies, okay, they think about the North American colonies of the British, British, British in India, French, um, Belgian, I think there's an acknowledgement that Germany, the German Empire, had an empire, um, but not as much concrete knowledge. Um, and I think it could be an effect of the language. Um, you know, the French the French, French definitions of French literature, and Tess, you know more about this than I do because I don't translate from French, but I do think Germany and the German language are looking back at their past and... Um, in, in new ways, but I think thanks to some of the books that are coming out, Anglophone readers will have a chance to look at that as well and really have our concepts of what it means to be German or to speak German challenged, which is really exciting. Mm-hmm. I'm really happy we got together. I'm, I'm glad to, you know, be able to sit down in a room where we once had the, the before time and, you know, kind of reconnect like this which is why i have to ask the embarrassing question what are you reading you you were gonna think about what you were reading for pleasure before reading anything Uh, non-fnl anything you cole's black paper i mean as soon as i get home i'm diving right back into that one i am reading um the new le carré the posthumous le carré (sighs) silver view fabulous and also i'm almost finished reading josh cohen's new book the Netanyahu's, which is as brilliant as expected. that's I've been hearing. It's fantastic. And I've been hearing it from people I trust, like like you. So you should get him on your show. And, and now that I have an in, I'm, I'm all set. <laughs> Maybe I'll show up on Thursday and, and give him the pitch. But will we have to be in masks? I do. We know. I'm not mm-hmm. sure. We're going to find out. So anyway, it's been wonderful having you guys back on. And, um, you know, I will come up here to Bronxville. We will sit down again, I, I hope, sometime soon. Great. And yes. Chicago. You know, I, I promise I'll make the trip out there. Maybe for the marathon. But yeah, absolutely. I need to run a first one sometime. So. Good place to start. And that was Tess Lewis and Alta Price. Sorry if I prattled on even more than usual, but I was kind of, I'd say emotional, but... Well, let's just call it anxiety because that's easier to to write off. Just, yeah, I had more anxiety about seeing those two again and revisiting that moment before. So anyway, if you're listening to this in real time, the 2021 Festival uh, Neue Literatur begins Thursday, November 11th, 2020, 2021, and runs through that Sunday. I hope you'll check it out. Go visit FNL's site to learn more about the theme. The authors will be participating, the schedule of sessions, and more. It's at festivalnoiliteratur.org. And that is F-E-S-T-I-V-A-L-N-E-U-E-L-I-T-E-R-A-T-U-R dot org. So no N, no E on the end of literature, and uh, Noi is N-E-U-E. You can also download a PDF of samples of translated work by each of this year's FNL authors through the site. And you can visit Tess's site at tesslewis.org, which is T-E-S-S-L-E-W-I-S dot org, and Alta's at altalprice.com, which is A L T A L. P-R-I-C-E dot com. Uh, from there, you'll find their articles and press and interviews and a ton of links to the, the wonderful books that they've translated. I picked up Tessa's translation of Walter Benjamin's Storyteller Essays after we spoke last year, but I have this big mental block about Benjamin after a bad experience with him in college 30 years ago, so I really need to get over that and start reading him again. Um, I will have links to all of this in the show and episode notes for this one. I want to thank Tess and Alta for um, 
welcoming me back, and I'm awfully happy for FNL to, to have returned after 2020's postponement. Now, you can support this podcast by telling other people about it, and you can also support it by telling me what you like and don't like about it and who you'd like to hear me record with or what movie or TV show or book or music or piece of theater or translation or whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. And you can do that by uh, writing me letters, postcards, emails. Uh, you can also leave a message on my Google Voice number, which is 973-869-9659. That goes right to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about me picking up. And you can leave a message up to three minutes long. Now, if you have money to spare, don't give it to me. I'm doing just fine. Uh, my expenses for the podcast are minimal. Um, really, I would much rather that you helped individuals or institutions in need. And you can do that through, well, with individuals, especially through uh, crowdfunding mechanisms like GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and the like. If you're looking for somewhere to start with institutions or foundations, you can look to your local food bank, the Poor People's Campaign, Freedom Funds, Election Funds. Um, there are a lot of things we can do to, to try to work towards a better world. So I hope you'll help. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, Talk it up on social media and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. Mm -hmm.